Hey YouTube, it's Jeff at Dark Moon Metals. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a little bit of work on the milling machine. Now, I need to make a part. Um, I first saw this thing and figured, eh, it's going to be easy, no problem. Yeah, how many times have those things backfired? This is the piece. This is a mast step for a sailboat. Uh, you can see where the mast has been resting in here, but one of the ears that holds the mast in has broken off. So what I need to do is replicate this. And when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy. All I have to do is get a piece of aluminum channel, and I'm good to go, right? Wrong. Now I gotta tell you folks, I looked everywhere trying to find a piece of channel stock that I could use that would make this project go real easy. Well, one of the things that I want to do is also beef up the thickness of this wall, and I couldn't find any pre-made channel that would allow me to do uh, what I needed to do to make this part. So, that's what I need to make the part out of. It's a solid billet of aluminum. And my experience with a milling machine is basically slim to none. The first thing I'm going to do is cut off enough material to make my part. I don't need to put this whole billet inside the milling machine. I'll just let this cut and I'll go off and do something else. Okay folks, so I'm sitting here at the milling machine. I'm still waiting for that billet to cut. It's been about five minutes. It's probably going to take at least five more. But I just wanted to touch base on a few things. First of all, I am not a machinist by any stretch of the imagination. My primary skill set is that of a welder. Um, I dabble in blacksmithing, and yes, I play with lathes and milling machines every once in a while, but I am not educated as a machinist. Um, if I had my way, I'd have a Bridgeport milling machine in here with a DRO, power feeds on the tables and knee, I know machines, I just don't have access to them. I'm going to be using a little Central Machinery Harbor Freight that's uh, been around for quite a number of years. I just picked this up this past year. It's come in pretty handy. Um, I don't have a lot of um, end mills and tooling for this mill yet, so this might be a little bit challenging, and I am going to be learning as I go. The machine shop experience that I have in aerospace, typically you'd walk up to a machine and it was already set up. They'd hand you a piece of metal, it would index inside of the vise or a jig, and you would follow a checklist. Move the part to these coordinates on the DRO. Drill a hole to this depth. Tap the hole. I never really set anything up on my own, unless it was in a press. I never set up any of the mill work. So, while it's true I have used milling machines before, I'm really, really just starting out and getting a feel for manual operations on a milling machine. So, if you see something I'm doing wrong, please let me know. Uh, the three things that I will tell you right off the bat before you even get started. You want safety glasses? If you're machining steel, gearing protection wouldn't hurt. And one thing that I've noted, just because it's really hot out here today, never underestimate the importance of hydration. If you're in a hot shop, being dehydrated can force you to become dizzy. Um, you could lose your balance, pass out. You don't want to be doing that around a machine. So always take the time to hydrate. That's why I don't drink beer. It goes way too fast. The bandsaw is done chewing on the aluminum. As you can see, it's not a bad cut. It's pretty flat. But if you look at the cross section of this, you can see this dip in the top of the billet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten that first in the mill. That's going to be my first operation. Alright guys, that's what it looks like after a couple of passes. It's nice and flat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this side face down and I'm going to mill this side to make this side flat. And I'll be the first one to admit I already made a rookie mistake. Uh, having used Bridgeport milling machines for a long time and full size milling machines, normally if you want to raise and lower the table you just turn a knee screw and it raises and lowers the physical slide table itself. With the small milling machine like this one, you have a crank which raises and lowers the head. The table doesn't move, it's stationary. It doesn't raise or lower on a Z-axis. This is your Z-axis. 
and I adjusted it for the block and I forgot to tighten it down all the way and the head started to pivot as I was starting to do the milling process and I didn't realize it until I started seeing the lines going crooked. I'm thinking to myself, why is this thing so far out of whack? I know the vise didn't move. And then I looked up at the head and noticed that it wasn't straight anymore. So, rookie mistake, but like I said, I'm still learning this. Before you load a piece that's been cut back into the vise, you always want to blow the vise out to make sure there's no chips in there. And any little burrs like this on the side of your job, you want to take those off with either a little bit of a belt sander. Um, I'm going to use a belt sander because this is aluminum. I don't want to clog up a file, but if it was steel, you would use a file or a deburring tool or something of that nature. All right, folks, here we go again. All right, you two, let me show you another noob mistake. And I do mean noob. It's getting kind of warm. Can you see the divots and the height changes in that? Well, let me explain how that happens. As I'm milling, this end of the stock is narrower in the vise than this end. And since the jaws close evenly, I'm getting a good bite on this end but not down here. And what was happening is that it was causing the material to actually lift up out of the vise on an angle as this was machi uh, machining and it was going deeper and deeper into the material, which is something I don't want. So I really don't know how I'm gonna fix that right now. Uh, the only thing I could think of is I'm gonna switch the material around in the vise and just keep the machine traveling in this direction. So instead of having it wanting to lift up, it'll be pushing down on this side and uh, this will be the tight end in the vise. Once I'm done machining this face, I can flip it over and I can straighten out the side so it'll sit in the vise nice and neat. All right, YouTube, I finished machining the top and the bottom. Now it will lock in the vise. This will be nice and even. I'll get a good grip on it and I'll machine this side and its counterpart. All right, YouTube, I'm on the last side. Five out of the six sides are done. This is the last one. Once this is squared off, I can start doing a little bit of my layout. Now, I just want to mention that this is taking me uh, a lot of time compared to somebody who has experience. I'm being very slow, very cautious, and I was really feeding the material through here very, very slowly because I'm not sure what the uh, capabilities of this cutter are. Um, I know it can machine steel, so I don't have a lot of issues with aluminum. I'm not worried about it in that aspect, but you want to try to get your feed rates somewhat consistent. You want to have the best cut possible. And as it turns out, I found out that if I speed up just a little bit, it doesn't give that much time for the aluminum to heat up and it actually cuts better. So I've increased my feed rate a little bit. Uh, I'm still turning it by hand. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to use this cutter on aluminum for my first time out because it's giving me uh, a lot of good uh, information, I'm learning a lot, and that's what being in the shop is all about. Uh, just keep on grinding away until you get your work done. I decided to come outside and take a break and do a little filming out here. Um, I needed a little bit of fresh air and I'm getting quite a bit of it considering it's windy and we have the remnants of a tropical storm moving up the coast, but here we are uh, at our current stage of production. Um, this has been machined so all the sides are pretty much parallel to one another and I'm ready to start doing my layouts and getting my dimensions for the piece I need to replicate. I've got the piece set up back in the vise. I'm going to be machining the height to its final dimension. Uh, I cut off a slab of aluminum on the bandsaw. I am going to have to reflatten this but that'll happen as I'm machining it down to its final, uh, final tolerances and dimensions. So. Uh, I figured that I'd rather have this laying around as an extra scrap of aluminum than all this stuff laying on the floor. And this, cutting it with the bandsaw, saved me a lot of time. Uh, I did make this block a lot bigger than I needed to at first because I really didn't know what to expect with this cutter and I wanted to leave myself a lot of extra, um, a lot of extra meat on the part just so I can experiment and if I had a couple of failures it wouldn't necessarily uh, cost me the entire piece. But now I'm pretty comfortable with it. So the next step is to machine down the height.
Okay guys, here's where it starts to get interesting. I need to do a little bit of math. Now I know the width of this part is three inches. And I also know that we want to increase the width of the outside walls. So if I want to bring these, these uh, thickness right here, this is about 180 thousandths. I want to increase that to 250. So I have to add uh, 70 thousandths. Which means I'm going to be increasing the width of this by 70 thousandths times 2 or 140 thousandths. So I've got the height stand dialed in at 3 inches, 140 thousandths. And I'm going to use a poor man's layout fluid, which is a king size magic marker. I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to color this black. Like so. And I'm going to scribe a line on that surface. Now, if you do have a height stand and you're using a garnet block, remember to move the stand, not the work. You don't want to take any chances of marring the granite. So place the granite or place the aluminum on the block and move the height stand. And I usually like to make two passes. So when I'm done, I think that line shows up pretty well. So now I'm going to mill it down to that line. Alright YouTube, before I start this cut, I want to clear something up that I've said in other videos. You'll hear me from time to time say, buy good quality tools, get a halfway decent machine, get something you know that's going to suit your needs. And um, there have been times when I've said, you know, don't get tools made in specific countries. And I just want to show you why. I'm not trying to be biased because I live in the United States, but there is a level of craftsmanship and a level of pride that people take in their work and while it's not unique to just the United States it's found all over the world but there are just some companies out there that don't care case in point this is a crank handle off of a really really old mill and I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see that but this is a casting and the hole is almost perfectly located and they went through the time to take down all of the mold marks and this has been in service for well over a hundred years. I picked this up from a buddy of mine. This came off of a mill that was made right around 1898. And that's the level of care and quality, just to make sure that even the hole was located properly. And I'll show you compared to this. This is a vise that I bought from Grizzly. Um, I got it this year, so it was made in a time when CNC technology is good. And some of these parts are cast, but let me show you the handle casting. I don't know how well you could see that, but can you see how off-center that hole is? The fit and finish is absolutely horrible, but yet this will pass quality inspection in some countries. So if you ever hear me go on kind of a little rant talking about quality and craftsmanship, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. YouTube, have you ever had one of those moments where you've wanted to pull your hair out? I mean, more so than I already have? Well, I'm running the piece through the milling machine, and because it's aluminum, I don't have the speeds quite right, and it's gumming up a little bit. I kept on thinking to myself, I wish I could lubricate this some way. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but if you use regular cutting fluid or cutting oils on aluminum, uh, a chemical reaction can take place, and it's not pretty. That's why if you look at something like Tap Magic, which uh, I know a lot of different guys on the YouTube use, you'll notice that they have a companion for it that's specifically for aluminum. So I thought to myself, well, you know, I can use the Tap Magic for aluminum. It's a lubricant, and it's better than nothing. And, uh, you know, I figured but I'd go through most of the bottle trying to cut this channel out. And that's when I remembered I have this cutting fluid for aluminum. It came with the milling machine, completely forgot I had it, didn't even cross my mind, so things are going to go a little bit faster now.
By now you may have noticed that I'm only milling in one direction. I'm only taking material off going one way. Now if you start delving deeper into the world of milling machines, you'll know that there's conventional milling and I believe it's climb milling. Um, I don't know the difference between the two. I know it has to do with tool rotation, the direction the piece is traveling in versus the, the cutting tool, but um, please don't ask me. I truly am dyslexic. Uh, I keep forgetting. I can't keep them straight in my head, but I know that the direction I'm traveling in, the machine itself feels a heck of a lot better. There's a lot less vibrations in the controls. Um, I'm getting a halfway decent cut, so I'm just going to keep continue doing what I'm doing. Alright YouTube, here we are at the end of the milling process. This is what I was working from. This is what I ended up with out of that big block. Uh, I'm glad that this is aluminum and not something harder. I only had one end mill, and even so I had to take just pass after pass after pass, and that's that has a lot to do with an experience. and. Um, you know, I'm just being cautious because I don't want to mess this up and have to start over again. The slots that are in this, I'm going to probably cut out with a jeweler's saw. Um, I don't have an end mill that's the appropriate diameter to come in here and cut this out in a single pass. And because I don't have a digital readout on the mill, I really don't trust myself just yet to come in here and do a multi-pass to, um, to open this up to the appropriate dimension. So I'm going to use a jeweler's saw for that and really take my time and make sure that that part's correct. But as you can see, I did thicken the walls. Profile's almost exactly perfect to what it was originally. Um, these rounded curves, I'm just gonna take that on the belt sander. Uh, you could tell that this has some kind of a radius in here. I'm just gonna come in here by hand. Uh, I've got the two by 72 belt sander, which I can go into the slack of the belt and put that bevel on. Um, that radius isn't critical, but that's where I am right now. And I'm going to stop here, I'm going to work, and then tonight when I come back I'll finish the project. Um, I have about an hour to kill before I actually need to be at work, but uh, I believe I mentioned this in another video. When you get to the point where you have to stop and uh, you have a, you know, a point in the project where you could take a break, do it. Um, don't rush to try to get something else done. Don't rush to try to get to the next step. Because that's typically the point in time when you start to mess things up. And to screw this up right now after all of the work that I put into it, and just the hours so far that's in this, uh, I'm not willing to chance that. So I will see you when I get back from work tonight. Alright YouTube, it's the second day into the project and normally it would not take me this long to do something like this, but uh, I had other things to do and I also have a night job now, just trying to make a couple extra bucks. But um, I went in with a jeweler saw this morning and I cut the channels in, as you can see. The only thing that's left to do is I need to drill four holes and this project's done. Alright YouTube, that's pretty much the video, but before I leave I'll show you the end results. Spin that around. Not too shabby for my first attempt. Uh, I will be honest though, if you are interested in machining in this type of work, check out Mr. Pete 222. Uh, he's a really cool guy. He reminds me a lot of my grandfather. Knows a ton about machine works, milling machines and lathes and so on. If you like this kind of stuff, check out his channel. I'll, uh, I'll link him in the description below. And as I look at this, you know, there's a lot of things in here that aren't picture perfect. You know, you could tell I haven't um, done this or I haven't had a lot of practice with it before, but considering I was able to go from this to a finished part, I'm pretty happy, even if it did take me a lot of time. But I'm glad that you guys stuck around and shared this little milling machine adventure with me. Uh, hopefully coming out with another video in the next couple of days, and until then, I will see you again soon. This has been Jeff at Dark Metals. Take care.